Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. Let's go to the New Living Translation. I'm going to do it all over again. Lord, have mercy. Woe and be to the God. What I, I pray it was just a technical issue. Lord of Jesus. Listen, if I were the devil, I would not want you to hear what I just preached. Amen. Okay? So I'm going to start all over again because I know how important it was. I figured something crazy was going to happen today to try to stop you from getting this message. So if I did it once, I can do it again. Watch this. All right, so uh, let's, let's start off at this, this point. It's the death of Christ and not his birth that initiated the New Testament. You have to die in order to get the New Testament going. Hebrews chapter 9, let's go to 16, 18 in the New Living Translation. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 through 18. Praise God. Thank you, Taffy. Hebrews chapter 9, 16 through 18. All right, for those of you who lost connection, pastor getting ready to start the sermon all over again. That was just a warm-up. I'm sweating, but we're going to do it. I've been preaching while y'all been offline. I've been ripping it, boy, <laughs> while y'all been offline. <laughs> Jesus, help me. <coughs> all right. All right, now look at verse 16. He says, now when someone leaves a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect only after the person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. That is even, or that is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. So Jesus is the testator. He made a will that cannot go into effect until he dies. So Jesus had to die. Then the New Testament went into effect because that's the requirement of being able to get what he left in that will. And then he said, even the Old Testament didn't go into effect until the blood of animals was shed. So, Galatians chapter 4, now go to Galatians 4 in the, in the NLT. So we know right now the New Testament cannot go into effect until Jesus dies. The New Testament cannot go into effect until Jesus dies. The New Testament did not go into effect when he was born. The New Testament did not go into effect when he was in the manger. The New Testament went into effect when he, when he rose from the dead. After his death, then the New Testament went into effect. Now, verse 4, he said, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. So, he sent his son, born of a woman. Jesus was subject to the law. So, when Jesus was born, the only testament that was in, in effect was the Old Testament. Jesus wasn't born and then operated in the New Testament. Jesus was born and operated in the only testament that was in force, and that was the Old Testament. But the Bible says that God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own son. So Jesus came, lived under the law, lived it perfectly under the law, so he could deliver those who were under the law from the law, and then they could be a part of that New Testament and be adopted as sons and children of God. So the reason why I shared that with you is because Jesus was born under the law. This means that in Matthew 1 and throughout the four Gospels, God's new way had not yet come on the scene yet. God's new way didn't come on the scene until 33 years later when Jesus died, and then the new covenant went into effect because you have the death of the testator. And so for 33 years, Jesus is walking on the earth as a prophet under the Old Testament. For 33 years, you find Jesus throughout the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus is now operating under the Old Testament because the New Testament wasn't available until he died. That's important. So whatever you read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're reading about a Jesus who is living, operating, and preaching based on the Old Testament, which was in effect because the blood of the animals have, has been shed. Now, watch this very carefully. In the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see the life and the, and the story of Jesus Christ. As long as Jesus was alive walking on the earth, the Old Testament was still valid. 
As long as Jesus was alive and operating on earth, the Old Testament was valid and in operation. So Jesus was a prophet abiding in the operation of the Old Testament. That's why you see this scripture, Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 18. Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 18. Let's read it out loud. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. Jesus is speaking. He says, I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. He says, I'm come, I, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Jesus is now living under the Old Testament because he came to fulfill it. He says, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle of the law uh, shall in no wise pass from the law until it all be fulfilled. Notice Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's what he was doing. He was fulfilling the Old Testament. He was fulfilling the law. No man could do it. Jesus was the only one who perfectly fulfilled and perfectly kept every ceremonial law, every civil law, every moral law. Jesus kept it perfectly, and no man could keep it, but Jesus did. Amen. Now, what I want to talk to you about is what else was he doing in, the God, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? What was he doing? What else was he doing? There were two ministries of Jesus, two ministries of Jesus that were taking place in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John while he was on the earth. Now, remember, as long as he's alive, there is no New Testament. There is no New Testament. As long as he's alive, there's no New Testament. So what was he doing? There are two ministries of Jesus. Number one, the first ministry of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was to enlighten everyone around, uh, around them concerning the true spirit of the law. So he wanted to show the true spirit of the law, what the law was all about. That was the first ministry of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Number two, he was going to begin to prophesy about that new way that is to come. He was going to prophesy about that grace-based system that is to come. He was to prophesy that you can now, under the new system, call God Daddy. And under the new system, you would learn about things like light and love and the new life. So Jesus, on one hand, was going to show you the real spirit behind the law. And then on the other hand, he was going to show you through prophesying that there's a new way coming, a new testament coming other than the old one. Amen. Now, let's deal with the first ministry of Jesus, and that was concerning the real spirit of the law. He preached the sermon in Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, we're going to start at 21 and 22. He preached a sermon in Matthew chapter 5 that was shocking. Because in Matthew chapter 5, he's going to tell you all the ways you can get judged and go to hell. He's going to, you know what Jesus was doing? He was preaching a hell, fire, and brimstone sermon. It blew my mind. Most theologians say, well, you know, he didn't really mean it. He meant every word of it. Somebody said it's in the red. You got that right. He meant every word of it. It was, not, it was not a sermon to talk about spiritual growth. It was a sermon to talk about judgment and hell according to the law. Watch what I'm saying here. Look at verse 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shall not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. It literally said thou shall not murder. But then he says, but I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a call shall be in danger of judgment. So it says you're not only in danger of judgment where murder is concerned, you're also in danger of judgment where anger is concerned. <coughs> so you're not just being judged because of, of, of killing. You're, you're now judged because of anger. And watch this. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell's fire. Jesus is talking about the things that you do that can cause you to be judged and end up in hell. Look at the next two verses. Verse uh, 27 and 28. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You're going to hell. You're going to be judged, not just for committing adultery, but for one split second of, lust, of lust. You're going to hell for those two things. That's what Jesus was saying. Look at verse 29. Well, he didn't mean that. Yes, he did. There's nowhere in this sermon where he says, I don't mean none of this. Look at what he said in verse 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, 
He said, go ahead and pluck it out. Cast it from thee, for it is more profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish and that thy whole body should not be cast into hell. So he says, since you're going to go to hell for a split second of lust, you now, with your own self-effort, you, you want to try to do it on your own? Well, pluck your eye out. Let your eye be destroyed so the rest of your... He's talking about going to hell. Basically, he says, keep your eye, go to hell. Keep your eye, go to hell. And then what you don't see here is he says, pluck it out. Pluck the right eye out. But if you lust with the left eye, you still could go to hell. God, dog. All right, look what he says here. Verse 30. Just think about some of you who are hearing this for the second time. You're getting more revelation. <laughs> and if thy right eye offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee, for it's proper for thee that one member should perish and, and that the whole body should not go to hell. Verse 43 and 45. 43 and 45. You have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. What? How am I going to love my enemies without supernatural love? You know people who are not saved. They don't love their enemies. People don't have Jesus in their life. They don't love their enemies. They hate them jokers. They want to cut them and kill them. <laughs> bless them that curse you. People that are not born again, they don't bless. They bless people out. They don't bless folks that curse them. He says, do good to them that hate you. Without Christ, you don't do good to somebody that hates you. He says, and pray for them that despitefully use you. That ain't happening in the life of a person that's not a Christian. And, and it says also pray for those that persecute you. No, I'm going to do something to get you back. That you may be children of your father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sendeth rain on the just as well as the unjust. He's asking you to do something that you cannot do without him. You can't do it without him. And in church, we looked at this and said, oh, yes, amen. Oh, I'm going to love my enemies. I'm going to do this. Not without Christ. You can't do none of this without Christ. And then he, he turns around. Look at the verse 48. 48 says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven, imperfect. I can't be perfect like my Father in heaven. Well, Brother Dollar, it doesn't mean perfect. It means mature. I can't, in comparison with God, I can't compare with God. So whatever God's maturity is in heaven, I can't come up to that level. Whatever God's perfection is in heaven, I can't come up to that level. I can't do nothing. I can't do anything without Christ. I can't, even, I, can't, I can't even compare or do nothing without Christ. Christ is my equalizer. I'm not even equal to God. More or less, be ye perfect as God is perfect. How am I going to do that? Okay, so what was going on here in this sermon? Jesus' listeners were familiar with thou shalt not murder. They were familiar with that and confident in their ability to keep that commandment they could probably last for years without committing murder. But then, don't even be angry with someone? That was certainly a new one that they had broken as recently as that morning. And then similarly, they heard, thou shalt not commit adultery, and were likely able to resist that temptation. But don't even look at a woman with lust. I mean, how are we supposed to control a split second impulse, they might have wondered. And then Jesus really drives his point home, and he tells them, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, be perfect just like God. What was he doing? You see, the first ministry of Jesus was to condemn the proud with an unattainable true spirit of the law. It was unattainable. Everything he preached here was unattainable. You can't do it. He's showing you the, the, the spirit behind the law. The law's telling you to do something you can't do. So what do you have to do? Well, how do you get out of this? How do you get out of judgment? How do you get out of hell? How do you get out of this situation where you can't do none of the stuff he just said do? You got to believe in Jesus. He's the only choice. He's the only way out of this situation. Now, imagine going to a church and some guy's preaching this and he doesn't understand that. You're walking around condemned. You're walking around guilty. You're walking around beat up. You're walking around hopeless because you're trying to do something that Jesus never, ever meant for you to do. So he is trying to show you the real spirit behind the law. And the real spirit behind the law is to show you that you are a sinner and to show you that you cannot attain any of this without 
the real spirit behind the law. And so let's look at these, this real quick. Uh, what was Jesus' motivation in presenting these impossible teachings? Why was he teaching stuff like this? So he could amplify the law to show that it couldn't possibly be obeyed. He told some to several body parts. He told others to sell everything that they owned. And he even called some of them snakes. Well, what was the result? The rich man went away sad. The Pharisee went away mad. Mission accomplished. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Romans chapter 5, verse 20 in NLT. I, I, why am I preaching this? Imagine the millions of people who have sat in church and heard ministers preaching from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John something that Jesus preached for the benefit of showing you it was not attainable, and that preacher is trying to convince you that that's attainable. Instead of saying, none of this can be done without Jesus, that everybody goes to hell except Jesus is the only one that can rescue you. That sermon preached judgment, that sermon preached hell, and nobody gets away from that judgment unless he makes Jesus the Lord and Savior. Look what he said. Here's the real purpose of the law. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. So the law was given as a mirror to show you how sinful you were. Think of that, to show you how sinful you were. But as people sin more and more, that's what the law did. It shows you how sinful you are. The law does not make you holy. The law won't make you better. The real spirit behind the law is to show you how sinful you are, to condemn you, to beat you up. The real spirit behind the law was to show you that. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. His grace was more abundant. His grace was more abundant. How do I get out of the killer sermon of Matthew chapter 5? The only way out is through Jesus. That is the only way out is through Jesus Christ. And look at 1 Corinthians 15, 56. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. He says, the, thing of, the sting of death is sin. The strength of everybody's sin is the law. So if you preach what Jesus, if you preach the part that Jesus preached in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which was the law, you're actually strengthening people's ability to sin more. And most people say, well, 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 that's what Jesus said in, in the Gospels. In actuality, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John probably would have worked better as a part of the Old Testament, showing Jesus as a prophet operating under the Old Testament because the New Testament didn't start until he died. How important is that? How important is that? Wow. And then we saw the Bible in Romans chapter 3, 31. And in, in Romans 7, 12, look at Romans 7, 12. He tells us to respect the law of Moses. Why? Because without it, we'd have never known our need for Jesus. Notice what he says. He says, uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 12. Romans 7 and verse 12. He says, wherefore the law is holy, the commandment's holy, it's just, it's good. So the law was holy, it was, it was, it was, it was good, it was perfect. It was flawless, but it wasn't good for us because we couldn't do none of it. Man had fallen. You can't do none of it. The only way you can do any of it is through Christ. It's still holy. It's still from God, but you can't do none of it in and of your own. So the law was given to show you that now that man has fallen, you can't do none of this law. You need a Savior. You need Jesus Christ in your life. And then in Romans 3.31, let's go there real quick. Romans 3.31. And look at Romans 3.31. He says something so interesting. Do we then make void the law through faith? He says, no. You, would, you, should, you should establish the law. Or another translation says you should esteem it or you should reverence it or you should respect it. Why? Because without it, it would have, you've never, you would have never known your need for Jesus. The law showed you your need for Jesus. Jesus was preaching the law in that sermon in Matthew 5. And it showed you that since you could not do any of this, and since none of it was attainable, you need Jesus. So respect the law. Esteem the law. It was the path that brought you to this place of saying, I can't do this. I need a Savior. I tell you, that's how important this is. 
Now, let's go to the second ministry of Christ. And I'll go through this quickly so I can show you what we need to do. The second ministry of Christ. Through Jesus' second ministry, he introduced a new hope to those of us outside the Jewish world. That first testament was mainly for Jewish people. The old covenant was limited to a select group, the Jews. So, so I don't understand most of the church who they're not Jewish. You're trying to live by an Old Testament ratified in the blood of animals that were only for Jewish people. You had to be born a Jewish person in order to even be uh, qualifying for that testament. That will was, was a will towards Jewish people. Your eligibility for the old way of the law was predetermined by your birth. And yet we still have black churches and European churches and Spanish churches teaching the Old Testament and trying to get you to do something that can't be done when you had to be born in it. You were not even to qualify for it in the first place. Listen to me carefully. But this changed under the new covenant. The wall between Jews and Gentiles were demolished. Look at Ephesians 2.14 in the NLT. The walls between Jews. When Jesus came, he prophesied about that new way of coming. Then he died, and the walls between Jewish and Gentile were demolished. Verse 14, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one place when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility and that separated us. There was a racism going on between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews were saying, I dare people that are non-Jews be the ones to become a part of the promises that were made to us. And Jesus was that peace offering and broke that wall down. And now those of us who were not born Jewish are now partakers of a New Testament that involved any man that believed. And so the Son of Man was lifted up and he began to draw all men to himself. In fact, let me show you this in John 12, 32. John 12, 32. Here's what Jesus said in John 12, 32. A lot of people miss this. I want you to understand. He says, and if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. He's talking about all men's judgment. Go back to verse 30 real quick. Let me read down here and then I'll I finally got to what I want to preach to. Jesus answered and said, The voice came not because of me, but for your sake. Verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now look at what he's talking about. He's talking about judgment. He's talking, the, the subject here is judgment. Now is the judgment of this world. And he's got a colon. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all judgment unto me. The word men is in italicized. He's talking about all of man's judgment. If, I be, if Once I'm on the cross, I'll draw, I'll draw all the judgment of what you couldn't do, all the judgment of Matthew chapter 5. He says, I'm going to draw all that judgment unto me. In other words, I'm going to take all the things that you could be judged for, and I'm going to draw that judgment on me. And through me, you will have life. And through me, you will have victory. Amen. Now, why did I say all of that? Because now I'm going to show you a clear distinction between what's happening with our lives as Christians and our understanding of the Word of God. And I'm going to, I'm going to compare and contrast the Old Testament, what was true under the Old Testament, and see if it's still true under the New Testament. I'm going to take four things, but I want to show you Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 3, and I want to compare it with Galatians chapter 3, 13. And I'm going to see if you're believing right. See, if you're believing according to the Old Testament and not believing according to the New Testament, wrong belief equals wrong living. <laughs> and your living's going to be wrong and your life's going to be wrong and things are not going to work because you're believing wrong. Look at this. And it shall come to pass if thou. I want you to underline if thou in your Bibles and keep it there forever. If thou. So that means there's a condition to this. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God, if you observe to do all of his commandments, which I command thee this day, it's conditional that the Lord thy God will set thee up high above all nations of the earth, if thou. It's conditional. None of this is going to happen unless you meet the conditions. Next verse. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. That's not going to happen if thou, unless you meet the condition. 
if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord first, then all the blessings will come unto you. Verse 3, blessed thou shalt shall be in the city and, and y'all, you'll be blessed in the field. All of this is conditional. The blessing of Deuteronomy 28 does not automatically come upon you, if thou. So you got to do something first in order to get the blessing second. It's conditional. But that's not the same thing according to Galatians 3.13. Look at Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13. I'm going to show you something, and you're going to see it in, in the New Testament after Jesus died. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law or from the penalty of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Curses is everyone that hangeth on the tree, keep going, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, how? Through Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament, the blessing came on you if you could keep these conditions. In the New Testament, the blessing came on you because of Jesus Christ. You're blessed because of Jesus. Jesus knew you couldn't keep the condition, okay? And so many people think, well, you got blessed because they did all them. No, they didn't. There are millions of people that died under the curse because they couldn't keep the blessing. Except they got blessed through, in those days, they got blessed through the sacrificial offering. They would bring a sacrificial offering. God said, I'll bless you through the sacrifice. That's the only way they got blessed. But it wasn't because of their own self-effort. And then in Galatians chapter 3, you're blessed because of Jesus. In the Old Testament, you're blessed because of your obedience to be able to do. If thou keep the commandments, if you could do the commandments, he said, if you keep the commandments, you'll get blessed. But that wasn't so in the New Testament. After Jesus died, he says, if you believe in me, you'll be blessed. There's a distinction. Now, I want to say something to you, and then we're going to look at this real quickly. Whenever you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... If thou, that is, um, that is an indication that it is a pattern of the old covenant. If thou, when you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if thou, that's a pattern of the old covenant, which means that is a part of what the old covenant says. You will not see if thou after Jesus died, because the new covenant is not based on if what you can do. The new covenant is based on what Jesus has already done, and you believe it. Okay, let's look at salvation. What are the real requirements of salvation? Have we been preached to that you had to do this, 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 this in order to be saved? Because if you did, that's a pattern of the O. Oh, look at Matthew chapter 9. And here's the thing. We think that that little middle uh, page divides the old and the new. I'm going to show you the operation of the law in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew 19, 16 through 17. Matthew 19, 16 through 17. Now, what happens when you go to Matthew and you still see the Old Testament? You're supposed to. Jesus is alive then. And I told you, as long as he was alive, the Old Testament is valid. Verse 16 and 17. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? The guy wants to know how to get saved, right? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But if thou, that's the first indication. If you're reading your Bible, the first indication is when you see that phrase, if thou, it's an old covenant pattern. And he says, But you want to know how to get saved? You want to know how to have eternal life? If thou will enter into life, he says, keep the commandments. So what if I take this out of Matthew, preach it to my 2020 church, and say, If thou want to be saved, you got to keep the commandments. I am preaching to people according to the Old Testament, and I'm not preaching to them according to what is true under the New Testament. So how do you get saved under the New Testament? Look at uh, Acts chapter 16, 30 through 31. Salvation under the New Testament versus salvation under the Old. He says, and he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, how do I do it? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and your house if they believe. Notice, after the cross, after the death of Jesus, what was required to be saved? Believe on Jesus Christ. Believe on what he has done so you can be saved. But before the cross, and in the Old Testament, you had to do something. If thou, then you can be saved. You don't see what you have to do here in order to be saved. You see, obviously, what Jesus has done, and you believe him. And so I believe, and I'm saved. Whoa. Come on. Let's look at this. Let's look at this big one right here. 
the one that used to bring me so much condemnation, forgiveness. In Mark chapter 11, 25 through 26, let me see if you can catch the pattern. Mark chapter 11, 25 through 26. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you, there it is, if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. Verse 26. But if you do not, that's a pattern of the Old Testament. If you do not forgive. So he's telling you that anything God's going to do for you is going to be based on what you do first. The Old Testament is all about what you do first, then God do second. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you of your trespasses. I can't tell you how many days I walked around in condemnation. Oh, my God, I hadn't forgiven this, so God hadn't forgiven me. I'm going to go to hell. I even had people tell me that if you didn't forgive such and so, such and so, when you died, you probably went to hell. Well, that is if you operated on the Old Testament. That's clear that that is a pattern of the Old Covenant. Let me show you one more thing. Matthew chapter 6 in the Old Testament, but it's in Matthew. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. But if you forgive men their trespasses first, then your heavenly Father will, will also forgive you second. That's the pattern of the Old Testament. That's the pattern of the Old Testament. And we're, and we're living according to these patterns of the Old Testament. And we're teaching people this. If you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will God forgive you. That is true under the Old Testament. That is what Jesus was teaching because he was a prophet operating under the Old Testament. But the New Testament, after Jesus died, what, would, what did he say? Ephesians 4.32. Ephesians 4.32 does not talk about what you need to do first and then God will forgive you. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. What he said, God forgave you first so you can forgive. <laughs> God did it first so you can forgive. Not you doing it first and then he'll do it. No, it's what Christ did and I believed it. And Christ did it and then I was able to do it because he empowered me. Look at Colossians 3.13. Colossians 3 and verse 13. He says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, what? So also do ye. My goodness. My goodness. It's what Christ did first, and then as a result of it, look at what you can now do second. That's what happened after the death of Jesus. Or what about love? And this got me. Man, I, 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 it just tore me to pieces. I just couldn't figure out how God expected for me to do this. Look at Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, verse 31. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. All right, these might be great commandments, but I can't do none of them. Are you kidding me? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Who can do this? Who can do this? I can't do this in my natural. And yet I preached it, and I can see people struggling like, I want to do it. And when it was preached to me, I'm like, yeah, I want to do it, but... With all my heart, no, I got other stuff in my heart. With all my mind, no, 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 no. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm going to go to hell because I don't love God with all my heart, my soul. And then I go to church and they get convicted. If you would love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, then you wouldn't do these things. Oh, God, I want to, but I just fail every time. Because Jesus knew it was unattainable to try to even love like this without him. He knew it was unattainable. And we're still preaching it because we don't know how to rightly divide the word of truth. And we're not interested in writing the divine the word of truth. We just want to pick a scripture somewhere on the left side of the Bible and say, well, it's still the word of God. Wow. But look, look at what it, what, what, how you love now. 1 John chapter 4, 19. Let's, let's look at what he said. 1 John 4, 19, after the death of Jesus, now that the New Testament is now valid, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. It's what he did first that enabled me to do a second. Oh, my goodness. And most of these things I'm showing you out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm not going to the left side of the Bible extreme to pick these out. 
I'm showing you Jesus speaking and saying stuff in the red that was according to the Old Testament. Because the New Testament didn't start until he died. Do you see what's going on in the body of Christ? You see what's going on in the body of Christ now? You got people walking around so confused, thinking the Bible contradicts itself, doesn't have any idea that, that what, what somebody just told them, and then they'll say, well, wait a minute, I don't like the Bible because it contradicts itself. Over here it says you got to do this, but over here it says you got to do that. That's because we haven't learned how to rightly divide the word truth. Preachers don't know it. The congregations don't know it. Certain denominations don't know it. And, and we're, we're saying and doing stuff, and we just don't have a clue. And then we're saying, well, God doesn't work. And the reason why is because you're trying to get God to work based on something that's obsolete. You're not trying to get God to work based on the valid testament that is alive. You're trying to get God to operate based on an invalid testament that is obsolete. You're trying to pray according to the Old Testament. If my people, which are called by my name, condition, it's got to meet these conditions. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, then I'll hear from heaven. That, 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 that's based on the Old Testament. You come over here in, in the New Testament and it tells you the right way to pray, that things are already done and you can praise him for it already being done. And no wonder people, they quit. I don't want to go to church. I don't have anything to do with God. God let me down because you're trying to mix the old with the new and it ain't working like it's supposed to work. We got to straighten this up. This is something the devil has kept in hiding for centuries. No wonder the stream went out. If I was the devil, I'd try to knock the stream out and, and burn the wires at the same time. I, I know why I'm under such attack, such slander, such dogging out, because we got to discredit this guy so nobody will pay attention to what he's saying. And the more and more I get an understanding, and I guess the devil thought I wasn't going to come back and teach it again. The more I understand about it, the more I come back and teach it again, and so that you can understand it, so we can start walking together and preaching the gospel. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now what are you prepared to do? What are you prepared to do? What are you prepared to do? Sure, I can get up here and I can hoop and holler and scream. It may not be valid. It may be from something that's invalid. There's a truth that was a part of the New Testament. And, and, and there's a truth that's a part of the Old Testament. But you got to realize which one is valid and which one is not. The Old Testament was valid while Jesus was alive. He is now dead. The New Testament now is valid with better promises. And we don't think it's a big deal. Oh, you're just, you're just straining that and that. That ain't a big deal. Just as long as you, it is a big deal. Especially when you're expecting for God to respond. Especially when you're expecting to receive some manifestations in your life. And some of you hadn't received manifestations in your life, not ever since you've been saved. Because you've been under the wrong agreement. And I'm telling you, in this series, we are going to learn how to believe God right so we can live right, so we can get it right, so our lives will be right, and we can be delivered right in Jesus' name. Most of the stuff people are preaching right now, just, you know, there is, there is there's something so amazing that God is doing, and I believe he wants to do it in your life. Uh, listen to this over and over again. Uh, thank God for my wife bringing me the note because I would have flipped out if I had stopped and found out that none of this got to you. Praise God, you got it now. Now you listen to it, and you listen to it over and over and over until you get it. Then you preach it to your mama, you preach it to your children, you preach it to your friends, and you preach it to your neighbors. And watch how things change in your life. I'm not finished here. This series is going to be in detail, and it's going to make a mark in your life that will never be erased. Maybe you're here right now, and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Maybe you've been trying to keep all the commandments before you made Jesus the Lord of your life, 
And today you realize that all I have to do is believe Jesus, that I got to have him. There's no way that Christian life can be successful with me trying to attain something that's unattainable in my own ability. I got to have him. So pray with me right now, this simple prayer. If you're not born again, pray this simple prayer and you want to be saved. Heavenly Father, I ask you to come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I receive you, Jesus. I believe in you, Jesus. I accept this new way of living. I accept your help. I accept your blood. I accept your sacrifice. I believe that all my sins are forgiven. Come, Lord. Sit on the throne of my life. You are my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to text the keywords, I'm saved. That's one word to 51555. Provide your name, your email address, and I'll send you a free ebook as a gift to you today. And welcome, welcome to the family of God. Go in the comment section and let people know, I just got saved. I just got saved. I just made Jesus the Lord of my life. Amen. Well, it's opportunity for prosperity time. It's opportunity to complete your worship. I don't believe worship is complete without gift giving. It's an opportunity to complete your worship. Just by what you have understood today, and just by you being a part of, of, of our fight against darkness to try to get the light out, let's praise God. Let's worship him with our giving. Let's go before God and say, God, my giving puts me in remembrance of every time you delivered me. My giving puts me in remembrance of the fact that I need you. My giving puts me in remembrance of all that you have done. And honor him with a gift. If you're giving right now and you'd like to give through the text technology, you can text World Changers, space and the amount to 74483. You can also call the number 866-477-7683 to give now. You can also go to our website, World Changers or Creflo Dollar Ministries. You can give online. You can use your PayPal there. Or you can mail to 2500 Burdett Road, College Park, 30349. Whichever avenue you choose to give by, we're grateful and thankful for the technology to be able to sow our seed, to be able to complete our worship, and to be able to give with a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving and appreciation for what God has done for us. God be praised for what is about to happen in your life. God be praised that you are warriors that will not give up, cave in, and quit. And when the devil comes in, then the Bible says like a flood, God lifts a standard up against him. In the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you, and thank you so much for your gifts that enables us to continue to make a mark in the lives of people that can never be erased. At this time, pay attention to our announcements, and then I'll be back for the benediction. Are we going to read our announcements? We're going to read our announcements. So Taffy's going to read the our, announcements. Uh, thank you for your patience and staying with us on the stream as we uh, lost you there for a minute, but you hung in there, and we so appreciate it and trust that you were blessed. The Word of God was so good. So thank you for just going over that again and all those who were watching, just hanging on and letting us know that you weren't getting it. So we got it all worked out. So a few upcoming uh, things that are taking place this week. Thank you so much for helping us to continue to serve those in need via our weekly grocery giveaways. So any watching today, if you're in need, you can feel free to come by our College Park campus on Wednesdays and Fridays. That's at 10 a.m. to receive groceries. And also, um, we appreciate you all continuing to feed your spirit with every tool that we've made available from showing up uh, for the daily confessions to faithfully streaming services, 
You all have taken the authority not to be moved by your circumstances. So we're gearing up this week for our sermon songs release, volume four. It's entitled Mastering Your Emotions. You saw a little bit of it today during the service, the song Joy. It's the tool that you need to master your emotions. You can tune into the official release this coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock p.m. And it'll be uh, available on Facebook and YouTube, our TV app. All you have to do is go to sermonsongs.com. And sure, it's on uh, all of our other websites as well. And you can avail yourself to that new release. Join Bishop Fuller for October's episode of It's Called Life. Uh, this episode is entitled Why Vote? This month, he'll be joined by Mayor Hardy Davis of Augusta, Georgia, and Mac Jackson from the Georgia House of Representatives. That'll be on Facebook and YouTube on October the 29th. And so I want to encourage everybody, go ahead and get out and vote this week. Get your early voting in and make sure if you need an absentee ballot, get that dropped off. And let's get ourselves to the, bo to the polls and let our voice be heard. Um, and if you're in need of a ride, you can text WCCI vote um, right now to register, receive a ride to the poll. And lastly, we just want to thank you so much for joining us today and just pray that your week just starts off with a blast and all the things that God wants to do. We open ourselves up. You know, anything can happen. All things are possible this week in your life. So just expect something powerful, expect something good to happen. Uh, we know that God is, uh, his power and his throne is just amazing. And we are believing God for his best to take place in your life this week. Amen. Amen. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you, everybody. Share the message all day today. Get a hold of it, and it'll make a mark that cannot be erased. We'll see you later. We love you.